Welcome to part 37 of the Ultimate Unsolved Mysteries Iceberg, where we explore true crime, urban legends, mysterious disappearances, myths and legends, and more. The Man in the Iron Mask. The Man in the Iron Mask remains one of history's most enigmatic figures. Even centuries later, his true identity and the reasons for his prolonged imprisonment continue to captivate scholars and the public alike. The Man in the Iron Mask was an unidentified prisoner held in various jails, including the famous Bastille. His story is intricately tied to the reign of King Louis XIV of France, under whose orders he was detained. The earliest records date the prisoner's confinement to July 1669, initially under the pseudonym Eustache Doger. He was held in custody for 34 years with no contact whatsoever with the outside world aside from his jailer. He was also closely guarded by the same jailer throughout the entire 34 years, with his jailer moving with him from prison to prison. The man in the Iron Mask ended up passing away in captivity in 1703, and speculation about his identity has only grown since. The prisoner was known for the mask he reputedly wore, popularized as being made out of iron. Contrary to popular legend, historical accounts suggest it was more likely made of black velvet, less dramatic, but equally effective at concealing the prisoner's identity. The conditions of the man in the Iron Mask's imprisonment were designed to ensure total isolation. Historical documents indicate that he was moved several times between various prisons. The cells were specially modified to prevent eavesdropping, with multiple layers of doors to seal off any sound. Reports indicate he was well treated and wore fine clothes, suggesting his high status or the importance of the secrets he held. The severe restrictions placed upon him, including threats against speaking and isolation from other prisoners, suggest his keepers believed he held secrets that could potentially threaten the French state. However, given this it is unclear why he wasn't simply eliminated, again suggesting some further importance to this man. Contemporary documents surfaced during the 19th century and included some of the correspondence between the jailer and his superiors. In these documents, the prisoner had been labeled, quote, only a valet shortly after his arrest, and that he was jailed for what he had seen, what he knew, and what he was employed to do before his arrest. After his death, his cell was immediately stripped and whitewashed, and his belongings were destroyed, steps taken to ensure that his identity would remain hidden forever. The identity of the man in the Iron Mask has spurred numerous theories. One prevailing theory posits he was an Italian count and diplomat named Matteo Le, who was involved in intricate diplomatic negotiations with Louis XIV. According to this theory, this Italian diplomat double-crossed Louis, leading to the diplomat's arrest. His identity closely matches that of the man buried under the name Marchioli leading some to speculate that the Italian Count and the Man in the Iron Mask were one and the same. However, the Count's alleged passing date is ten years prior to that of the Man in the Iron Mask. Further, I would suspect, if this was the case, the disappearance of the diplomat would have caused a significant stir and complaints by his host state. However, this could potentially be explained by a highly secretive diplomatic mission, which all parties wish to keep under wraps. However, if this was the case, this diplomatic status may explain why the man in the Iron Mask was imprisoned for 34 years, rather than outright slain. Ending a diplomat has long been held to be an extremely poor form. Another popular candidate is the valet Eustache Dauger, arrested for reasons not fully documented, adding layers of mystery and speculation. And if this name sounds familiar, this was the presumed pseudonym under which the man in the iron mask was arrested. I suppose it would be some real 4D chess to issue an arrest warrant for someone by their actual name. 
and indicate that the name given in the warrant is actually a fake. Some historians speculate that the valet might have been involved in or privy to political scandals that required his permanent silence. This theory is supported by the specific instructions given to his jailer to prevent him from communicating with anyone except to express his immediate needs. However, this theory is weakened by the fact that if this had been the man's identity, he would have almost certainly been permanently silenced in another more obvious way. Voltaire and later Alexandre Dumas were instrumental in cementing the legend of the man in the Iron Mask, each adding their own speculative spins. Voltaire proposed theories that ranged from the prisoner being a twin brother of Louis XIV to a disgraced nobleman or a disgruntled governmental official. Alexandre Dumas also explored the idea that the man in the Iron Mask was the twin brother of Louis XIV and likely contributed more to the popularization of the case than anyone. Their accounts and the dramatic flair they employed ensured that the story endured through the centuries as a blend of fact and elaborate fiction. Another theory proposed in the 20th century indicates that the man in the Iron Mask was actually Louis XIV's father. Notably, at the time of his birth, Louis XIV's parents had been largely, though not totally, estranged for over a decade. While this hypothetical situation does potentially make sense on paper, everything about the theory is circumstantial at best and speculative at worst. However, if this theory was true, it makes sense why the individual's face was always covered, as perhaps he bore a resemblance to Louis XIV. Further, it would explain the reluctance to simply end the man, as Louis XIV was a deeply religious man, and there's a line or two in the Bible about respecting one's parents. The true story behind the man in the iron mask might never be fully uncovered due to the scant and often contradictory historical evidence. However, like some of the other most famous unsolved mysteries, it's this scant evidence that has led to centuries of rampant speculation and fascination. Also, thanks to community member Austin Lee for this suggestion. Remember to join the Discord or leave your suggestions in the comments below. The Phantom Barber of Pascagoula In the midst of World War II, the small town of Pascagoula, Mississippi, became the backdrop for a series of bizarre and unsettling incidents that would later be attributed to an individual dubbed the Phantom Barber. The town, which had seen its population swell due to the wartime shipbuilding efforts, found itself grappling with a peculiar menace that targeted the hair of its young female residents. Also, if you've been following the series, you'll know that Pascagoula punches above its weight, with a significant alien abduction occurring there in the early 1970s. The Phantom Barber's activities began on a night in early June 1942, when he first struck at the Our Lady of Victory's convent, cutting locks of hair from two young girls. This initial intrusion set the pattern for subsequent events, where the assailant would cut window screens to enter homes and cut the hair of the occupants while they slept. The town's alarm heightened when these incidents were later accompanied by more violent attacks. This included one incident where a couple was assaulted in their home, escalating the community's fear. Notably in this attack, there doesn't appear to have been any haircutting incident, which makes me question the relationship between the two cases. Local law enforcement, overwhelmed by the peculiar nature of these crimes, struggled to make headway in the investigation. The FBI was eventually called in, and the town increased its night patrols in a desperate bid to capture the elusive intruder. Amidst rampant speculation and fear, various theories circulated about the barber's motives, ranging from psychological disturbances to espionage-related activities. The case saw a significant development in August 1942 when William Dolan, a chemist known in the community, was arrested. Notably, 
Dolan had been educated in Germany and was suspected of having sympathies with the enemy cause. However, it's difficult to tell if he actually had these sympathies given that all reports on him appeared to portray him as a weird, abrasive, and disliked individual. Curiously, locals at the time believed that these hair-chopping incidents were an effort to subvert national security, which seems quite suspect in retrospect and appears to suggest mass hysteria. Although charged and convicted for the attack involving the couple, Dolan was also suspected of being the phantom barber, largely due to the discovery of a bundle of hair near his house. Despite his conviction, doubts lingered about his involvement in all the incidents, and after serving part of his sentence, he was released following a lie detector test that he passed. I note that I was unable to find out whether he was ever formally exonerated for his crimes. Notably, some speculate that the Phantom Barber was much more of a phantom than one would initially believe reading the news articles. Under this theory, he was a figment of the imagination of the people of Pascagoula, brought on by the psychological stress of being at war. Further, it is notable that the town grew immensely during the war to accommodate shipbuilding, and as such, people were separated from their extended families, causing feelings of dislocation. Some have suggested that this was a perfect storm for mass hysteria to take hold in the town. The true motives and full identity of the Phantom Barber remain unsolved, leaving room for ongoing speculation and interest. If you're enjoying my content, please hit the like and subscribe buttons and the notification bell. Also, I release content very regularly, so I can't emphasize this enough. Ring the bell and turn on all notifications so you're never behind on this series. Also, if you really want to take it to the next level, please consider signing up for a YouTube membership or a Patreon membership. You can support for as little as 99 cents a month. Also consider joining the Lazy Chill Zone Discord community. At present, we have nearly 100 people on board. The Overton Bridge Dog Mystery. The Overton Bridge, situated near Dumbarton, Scotland, has been associated with a deeply unsettling phenomenon involving dogs since the 1950s. Known colloquially as the Dog Self-Chosen Conclusion Bridge, it has reportedly been the site where numerous dogs have inexplicably leaped over the edge into the ravine below. And yeah, let's just say the locals aren't calling it the Dog Self-Chosen Conclusion Bridge, if you catch my drift. The structure itself, a Gothic-style bridge built in 1895 by architect H. E. Milner, spans the Overton Burn and was originally part of an extension to the driveway of Overton House. Overton House itself is strongly associated with paranormal activity, which gives the entire area a vibe of general spookiness. The bridge gained its sinister reputation in the latter half of the 20th century when local residents began noticing an unusual pattern of dogs leaping or falling from the bridge. Over the years, various reports have estimated that hundreds of dogs have jumped, with some sustaining injuries and others meeting their end. The incidents have led to widespread media coverage and have sparked a mix of theories ranging from the scientific to the supernatural. One prevalent theory suggests a natural explanation involving the acute olfactory senses of dogs. Or to put it in non-scientific terms, dogs are strong sniffers. Researchers propose that the presence of strong scents from minks or other wildlife in the area may lure dogs to leap off the bridge. The bridge's structure, which can make the drop seem less steep than it actually is, might also contribute to the confusion for the animals. The sloping nature of the side of the bridge may form an optical illusion to dogs, wherein they believe they can continue running down the side. On the other hand, supernatural explanations have also been widely circulated and are favored by many dog bridge theorists. These include the presence of the White Lady of Overton, a ghostly figure said to haunt the bridge and the surrounding estate, which some believe influences the dog's behavior. 
This figure is allegedly the spirit of Grace Eliza McClure, the widow of the bridge's creator, who has been said to roam the area since her husband's passing in 1921. Despite these theories, there is a significant amount of skepticism regarding the notion of dogs deliberately causing their own demise. Many experts dismiss the idea as a misunderstanding of canine behavior, suggesting that dogs don't have the capacity to end themselves on a consensual basis. However, anyone who has been around a variety of dogs knows that they do feel a wide range of emotions, and they all have very different personalities. Therefore, I would question any expert who categorically denies the possibility of a dog committing such an act intentionally. Some skeptics dismiss the entire thing as an urban legend, suggesting that the bridge is not routinely used by dogs for this purpose. However, this discounts well-documented recent accounts, and as such, this cannot be dismissed as a simple urban legend. In 2004, a family and their golden retriever were walking across when the pupper unexpectedly sprinted and leaped off the bridge. While the dog sustained moderate injuries, it did thankfully survive the fall. Over the next six months, a well-documented pattern emerged with at least five more dogs jumping off the bridge. In 2014, a Springer Spaniel suddenly acted out of character and jumped off the bridge after staring intently at something unseen above it. Why dogs choose to commit this act at this specific bridge, if they do choose it at all, remains unknown and all possibilities remain on the table. I would suggest that for the purposes of protecting the pupperinos, they should be restricted from crossing the bridge. The Short-Faced Bear The giant short-faced bear, often known by its scientific name, Arctotus simus, stands as one of the most intriguing and formidable predators of North America's Pleistocene epoch. This period spanned from about 2.5 million years ago to 11,000 years ago. This bear was notable for its incredible size and speed, distinguishing it from the modern bears we are familiar with today. The Arctotus simus was one of the largest land carnivores in Pleistocene North America, with some males weighing between 1,600 to 2,500 pounds and standing up to 12 feet tall on their hind legs. Unlike today's bears, which have a more rounded foot, the short-faced bear had feet with toes that pointed straight forward, allowing for a fast and efficient gait. It is estimated that these bears could run at speeds exceeding 40 miles per hour, making them not only massive, but also incredibly fast. For reference, this is about two thirds the speed of a cheetah on a predator that weighed up to 20 times what a cheetah weighs. Their diet predominantly consisted of meat, as indicated by their physical adaptations. Simply put, the giant short-faced bear wasn't stuffing its face with fish heads, sedge grass, blueberries, and the contents of picnic baskets like its modern cousins. They possessed a large, broad snout with huge nasal passages, likely helping them to have a keen sense of smell to detect food sources. The structure of their jaws and teeth suggests a strong capability for biting and crushing, useful for consuming large prey or scavenging on carcasses left by other predators. Notably, the giant short-faced bear is speculated to have incredibly dense bones, further contributing to its incredible power. This all begs the question, why did the giant short-faced bear an apex predator of virtually unequaled power, end up going extinct while lesser Bruins thrived. The extinction of this majestic terror around 13,000 years ago is still not fully understood, but appears to have been influenced by a toxic combination of factors. The decline in large prey species, changes in habitat due to climatic shifts, and increased competition from other carnivores, including early humans, likely contributed to their disappearance. This extinction coincided with broader megafaunal extinctions at the end of the Pleistocene. 
Notably, some claim that certain bear cryptids, like the Bergman's bear and the McFarland's bear, are actually relict populations of this monster bear. Make sure to subscribe as I will be covering these exciting bear cryptids in upcoming entries in this series. The Mechanics of Brontosaurus Reproduction The reproductive behaviors and mechanisms of Brontosaurus, a genus of large herbivorous sauropod dinosaurs from the late Jurassic period, are subjects of much scientific speculation. Brontosaurus, like many other dinosaurs, is thought to have used internal fertilization to reproduce. This is inferred from the anatomy of current avian and reptilian species, which share evolutionary traits with dinosaurs. The size and weight of Brontosaurus pose intriguing questions about their bedroom habits. The physical logistics of reproduction for such enormous creatures have led to hypotheses that they might have facilitated their extracurricular activities in pools supporting their weight and facilitating easier movement. However, this is purely speculative as no direct evidence of aquatic mating behavior exists. Also, if there's anyone in the audience with an academic background in paleontology, please let me know in the comments below what cutting edge theories on this are in the scholarly world. The Falling Birds of Bibi. On New Year's Eve of 2010, the small town of Beebe, Arkansas experienced a startling phenomenon. Approximately 5,000 red-winged blackbirds fell from the sky, creating a confusing scenario for both residents and scientists. This event attracted global attention due to its unusual nature and the startling sight of numerous birds found lifeless in the town. The immediate aftermath saw the local community and authorities quickly mobilizing to clear the birds from public spaces. Analysis by several state and national laboratories, including the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission and the National Wildlife Health Center, concluded that the birds suffered from blunt force trauma. This was attributed to collisions with hard surfaces as a result of a sudden mass exodus from their roost. Experts suggested that loud noises, likely from New Year's Eve fireworks, startled the birds, causing them to fly atypically low and thus collide with various objects. This incident is not isolated in its occurrence, yet its reasons are somewhat distinct. Similar events have happened due to various natural and man-made factors, like weather conditions or loud noises. However, what makes Beebe's event notable is the combination of the bird's poor night vision and the likely unexpected disruption caused by fireworks. Typically, blackbirds roost at night and are not adept at navigating in darkness, which compounded the tragic outcome of that evening. Despite thorough investigations, some uncertainties remain regarding what exactly triggered the birds to take flight that fatal evening. This has led to numerous theories, both scientific and otherwise. While the predominant explanation involves the reaction to loud noises, other incidents of large bird fatalities have been linked to natural occurrences like lightning or hail. Interestingly, others speculated that the mass passing of so many birds was a supernatural or divine event, which likely foretold coming problems. And this does have significant historical precedent. In ancient Rome, augurs were priestly officials whose role was critical in guiding the public and private decision-making of the state and its leaders. These religious specialists interpreted the will of the gods by observing natural signs, particularly the behavior of birds, known as taking the auspices. The auspices involved scrutinizing birds' flights, eating patterns, general health, and singing. Depending on how the birds were doing, observations could determine the favorability of undertaking various actions, such as battles, legislation, or the founding of cities. Anyway, I'm no expert on augury, but I suspect a massive heap of formerly living birds littering the streets likely foreshadows a quote, black swan event. Pardon the wordplay. Also, 
If fireworks were actually the cause of this event, wouldn't these birds be perishing en masse every 4th of July and every New Year's Eve? The BB event, though clarified to an extent by official investigations, continues to be a subject of curiosity and speculation. The Omukade. Big shout out to community member Austin Lee for this interesting yokai suggestion. The Omukade, a term which translates to giant centipede in Japanese, occupies a fascinating niche within the realm of yokai, or supernatural creatures, in Japanese folklore. This creature is depicted as a mammoth centipede, so vast it could encircle mountains, manifesting the Japanese cultural propensity to blend natural elements with supernatural mystique. Historically, the omukade was known for its ferocity and formidable size, capable of preying on humans and even dragons, which places it among the most fearsome of yokai. Interestingly, despite its fearsome reputation and strength, the omukade has a peculiar weakness to human saliva, its Achilles heel, so to speak. One legendary account involving the omukade tells of the hero Fujiwara no Hidesato. According to folklore, Hidesato slew a giant omukade near Lake Biwa, saving the local populace from the terror inflicted by the creature. Notably, the creature's vulnerability to human saliva played a pivotal role in its defeat by Hidesato. Hidesato coated his arrows in his own saliva, significantly weakening this mighty beast to the point that a human could take it down. Make sure to ding that notification bell if you haven't done so already. As usual, I love you all and thank you all for your support. Shout out to my patrons Noah Schubert, Ice Mocha, Kurt the Squirt, Monoxide Wendigo, Jeffer Metcalf, Z Volts, Director Delta, Unknown Delusions, Faye, Jack Russell, and Blasphemous. Big shout out to YouTube member Jordan All. Until next time, stay safe and healthy. Peace out, everyone.